Hello and welcome to My Security TV. My name is Chris Cubbage with My Security Media, and this is another Tech and Sec Weekly. In fact, it's the last for 2020, uh, and we're going to be covering off on Space 2.0 Industry Insights Number Two, uh, and we have Gilmore Space Technologies and MathWorks joining us. Let me just walk through what we've been up to this week, and then we'll move into our interview. Uh, for those that do follow us, uh, naturally we cover off on our four key domains: aerospace and space defence and national security, cyber security and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. If you happen to be watching, uh, welcome to press like. We'll be as engaging as we possibly can. Uh, let us know if you're watching and from where you might be watching anywhere in the world uh, and welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to be going for about half an hour, maybe up to 40 minutes uh, with the interview. We'll see how we go, but these are two very interesting companies. So uh, I've got lots of questions for them. And introducing, where are we going? Here we go. Um, we have Peter Kinney uh, with the Head of Sales for Gilmore Space Technologies and Stefan Moroni, uh, the Country Manager with MathWorks. We're going to bring them on shortly. And this follows on with this is in Industry Insights number two. And on uh, yeah, Tuesday, we ran uh, Industry Insights number one with Lloyd Damp, the CEO with Southern Launch and James Powell, the co-founder with Dawn Aerospace in New Zealand. Uh, and in the end, that turned into a rocket launches versus space planes uh, type of discussion. But that is available on our YouTube channel. Very interesting. Uh, Lloyd is in South Australia uh, in terms of what they're doing with their rocket launches. Uh, and James is in Christchurch. Uh, just yesterday, we did our virtual awards ceremony for the top women in security in Malaysia. Very successful set of awards. Uh, definitely check out the top 10 winners and thank you to our partners, particularly ISACA uh, Malaysia chapter and ASIS International Malaysia, as well as uh, Malaysian Women in Security and with Secra, Bonnie Butland there. So that's going very, very well and uh, very pleased with the outcome on that particular event. On Monday, we ran an Active Directory security session with uh, Ben Moody with Alcid and Kevin Tran, the director for APJ with Spider Labs. Uh, again, very interesting and given some of the recent attacks that are coming out, uh, with US Treasury, FireEye and the others, uh, Active Directory is certainly uh, one to be watching and particularly on that threat landscape uh, and what you should be doing. So there's some live demo attacks. And again, we just made that session live uh, after you had to register. And on Wednesday, we released our interview with Milestone Systems in their Melbourne Experience Centre and their uh, open uh, platform for video management systems and looking at the COVID-19 tracing uh, technologies that they're doing with video analytics uh, and very interesting again and that is also on available on MySec TV. So just wanted to update the audience we're releasing a new website it's up in terms of a domain uh, but we're changing over from uh, sort of moving space and defense off the drastic channel so we have drasticnews.com and uh, drastic will just stay on drones and robotics and then the space and defense will move over to our spaceanddefense.io channel. Uh, you, you can register for that channel if you want to stay in, in touch, but otherwise you can just stay on the, our Tech and Sec Weekly and we'll walk you through it. But welcome to uh, check out spaceanddefence.io and certainly coming in 2021. Now in terms of the, the news and just to kind of warm you up, we've got a hello from Northern California. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the US uh, Space Command has just released, so Russia has been conducting an anti-satellite missile test uh, in the last week or so, uh, very interesting in terms of the militarization of space, uh, and it's something that uh, we'll cover off into the future as well. Uh, Gateway one and attributable one uh, test moves. So they first have got the F-22 and an F-35, their first secure bi-directional data sharing. Uh, so as they bring on these sort of military platforms in there, what they're calling IOT.mil, uh, interesting. But again, uh, there must be a bit of a challenge to bring these uh, different systems on and also keeping that security uh, for that data sharing. Uh, well done to China. Their Chang'e's E5 moon probe uh, has returned back to Earth, uh, landed in Inner Mongolia. Uh, and that's the first lunar sample to get back to Earth since the 1970s. So well done. Uh, and uh, we'll be interested to see what the results come out of that one. And here in Australia, SmartSat CRC has launched uh, the Aurora, uh, Aurora Space Startup Cluster. That's 65 member companies representing every part of the space supply chain. Uh, and we have uh, had the SmartSat CRC CEO, Andy Coronius, on 
our previous uh, episodes on our Indo-Pacific series. And we'll definitely be catching up with Andy, I hope, in 2021 and find out more about that. That, is, that particular article there is available on drasticnews.com. So look, without further ado, uh, we've got uh, we've got at least one or two people and we are streaming correctly. So we're ready to, to bring on Peter Kinney. Uh, Peter, here you come. And let me just change my graphics over. There you are. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and Stefani Mawani. Did I say that right, Mawani? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, look, gents, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've had obviously our pre-interview discussion uh, and I'll just hand over to each of you just to introduce yourselves uh, and uh, your very interesting companies. I think we'll go with Gilmore, if you don't mind. So, Peter, um, Gilmore Space Technologies, we've got a number of sort of media releases that we've been covering off on our Drastic channel. So uh, most of our audience will be familiar with Gilmore and some of the interesting things that you're doing. Well, they should be. Well, they are. They're about to be more. Um, yeah, just introduce uh, yourself and, and Gilmore, and then we'll sort of move into the business of, of what sort of space programs you're doing. Oh, thank you, Chris, and also um, thanks, Stefano. Um, look, Gilmore has been founded uh, by two brothers in Queensland, and uh, most people don't realise that we started our hybrid rocket program back in 2015, so we've been, uh, since our first launch, it's been five years. And we're heading in, we're leading the sovereign rocket program uh, push in Australia, so we're hoping to be Australia's leading manufacturer in, and dedicated uh, space employer. Uh, to give you a bit of understanding of how we're funded, we're venture capital based funded um, and that's given us a, a capacity and a capability with about currently with about 55 employees mm -hmm. and we're growing quite fast. We are based, as I said, we're based on the Gold Coast uh, in Queensland and what our primary uh, objective is is to develop lower cost hybrid uh, low risk technologies for propulsion and that's going to give us the ability to launch small payloads into um, a very very no uh, various number of orbits and we're actually hoping to launch those rockets here in Australia so our program puts us into about 2022 um, when we're going to launch our first vehicle we're hoping that it's in the first quarter uh, but this is the space industry uh, so I think that we've got um, a lot of uh, energy and a lot of drive to meet those dates and one thing you would have also seen in the uh, in the news articles is that we actually have a commercial payload going up on that first vehicle. That commercial payload um, is currently uh, taking up most of the payload bay in the first vehicle. Obviously the first vehicle you don't send up the full payload because uh, you want to make sure that everything works and you give yourself a lot of, um, I guess, leverage in, in performance and what have you but um, that is shaping up and we'll see how things go in the next couple of months but that may actually uh, set a new record for the amount of an Australian payload lifted into orbit from an Australian rocket into uh, into space so that's very exciting um, by the time we hit to get into 2023 2024 we'll be uh, pushing up around about 300 kilos into right. low earth orbit um, and potentially up to 500 kilos. So the program of works doesn't stop there. We're not. Uh, we're, we're going to be a little bit more like a, a SpaceX in so far as that we're looking at developing heavier and heavier lift vehicles. And um, we think that we may even be around the two tons by 2025 with a, a modified improved vehicle. So eventually, um, we're hoping to actually, just as SpaceX does, we're hoping to put humans into space. That will take us a little bit longer than uh, it took Elon Musk, but we believe that we've got the capacity and the capability here to do it. Uh, so is that, is that yeah, right? yeah <laughs> I, I don't, and there's about a million questions and then I can, unfortunately, we, we, um, we, I need to cover off MathWorks too. I, I, as I mentioned, it's a big topic. Um, but I'll come back to you in terms of the types of vehicles. You are just a launch vehicle. You're just building the, the, the rockets and the, and the launch vehicles. You're not making any of the payloads are involved in that aspect as well? We've just announced recently that we will start making payloads. So we saw a gap in the market. Um, the, the market in Australia, uh, and rightly so, is uh, mainly based on research and universities. And that market typically looks at a smaller payload, which is a, a class of satellite called a CubeSat. 
And those CubeSats have a volume of about a litre. So it's one, uh, 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres is a U. And a popular design for a U goes in about three U's, six U, 12 U's. So you end up with, you know, still a small, a very small satellite. Um, what we need to do to mature um, the capability of satellites in Australia is move up to a new size. And that's based on the ability to resist radiation, longevity in space, the amount of power that you need to run some of the sensors. It's very difficult to go and put an Earth observation sensor with a 50 centimetre diameter uh, mirror lens in a one centimetre cube set. Okay, uh, sorry, 10 centimetre cube set. So we're looking at a larger format and we announced that in a partnership with Griffith University and that um, we're going to call that the GSAT. So um, it was, uh, uh, I, I don't think it was our most uh, brilliant marketing ploy, but it does stand for Griffith University and Gilmore Space Base started with G. And uh, we've launched that concept and we've had a, a, an enormous amount of um, positive response uh, to, that, to that concept. It's not developing the payload. So the payload would be the sensor or a comms package or position navigation and timing package. But what we're looking at is we're looking at um, the bus, which is the box and the, um, the equipment that takes that particular sensor into yeah. orbit. So once again, it's, it falls into our, our, our sort of our business line, which is access to space. How do we get these people access to space? And most people are focusing on their sensor and so that fits very well within the business. There must be a heap of research and particularly on payloads. And I'm thinking, you know, I mentioned we cover drones. I've been looking at drones for, you know, a long, long, long time, a decade or plus, and it's the, always the payload to match the vehicle and then the, the two. And I, this is where MathWorks will come in, uh, Stefan. If I think uh, country manager, obviously, for Australia, I'm not too sure if you cover New Zealand as well, but maybe introduce yourself in terms of your role and math works because everything in space is about weight and scale and, you know, there's a uh, velocity, there's, uh, I can see where math works. The moment I saw it uh, associated with space companies, it's like, okay, well, that's a given. So maybe introduce us to math works. Most of us will be aware of it. Yeah, sure, Chris. Um, yeah, so Stefan, I'm, I'm based here in Sydney. We have a, a team in Australia and we're covering New Zealand as well. Uh, as Peter know, we have people in Queensland, uh, South Australia, Victoria, and, uh, and our uh, offices in Chatswood, New South Wales. Uh, MathWorks uh, is the maker of MATLAB, which I'm sure your audience know by name, and Simon Inc. Uh, for those who don't know what is MATLAB and Simon Inc., we're really the foundation software for engineers and scientists to accelerate the pace of their innovation and development. Um, so, and any it covers almost all all the spectrum of engineering. Um, again, I don't know to know. I don't need to know what you guys drive every day. Um, your car has been designed and developed with our tools, uh, and it is the same in in aerospace, both in defense and, and aerospace. Um, matter of fact, in Australia, our, our largest industries is aerospace and defense. Uh, MathWorks is a privately owned company, so you don't hear much about MathWorks on the uh, on the stock market. It's still owned by the uh, the founder of the company, right. uh, Jack Little, who is uh, who is still the CEO, and the the headquarters is based out of Boston. Um, we have about more than two thousand five hundred uh, people um, and a million uh, a billion US dollar plus uh, revenue. Maybe one comes to mind in terms of that simulation, you're obviously advanced there. What are some of the key trends in the simulation technology, particularly sort of augmented reality and virtual reality type of environments as well? How much is going on in that space? Yeah, so where we play in is, is really simulating a complex system and the underlying uh, math, the underlying mathematics that, that goes with the simulation. So it really goes into the, um, the uh, for example, the propulsion system, talking about space, propulsion system, uh, the navigation system, the guidance system, all of these systems are extremely uh, sophisticated and, and, and Peter will probably can comment more than me on that. And therefore, uh, the engineers and developer cannot um, take the risk to inject uh, errors, especially for space system, you have one shot. Yep. Uh, uh, and so simulation becomes extremely important. 
uh, extremely important to really simulate those systems virtually, um, call that digital twins these days, um, and inject uh, potential uh, problem scenarios and see how the system reacts and, and, and gets robust. Um, in terms of virtual reality, really our tools are, are, are used in conjunction with virtual, virtual reality tools uh, or 3D modeling tools, uh, especially in, um, in simulation piloting and, and, and really um, showing how it works and, um, and especially in the guidance uh, side of things. And uh, Gilmore, uh, Peter, is sort of using and, and working with MathWorks as well. Maybe how, to, how what is that partnership? What is that? Uh, you're obviously using MATLABs and uh, their simulation tools as well. Yeah, so um, part of our team uses uh, the MathWorks tools. So we have to um, look at where Stefan was um, suggesting, and that is what is the areas that need the deep underlying maths? And so it depends on which division that we're in depends on which uh, or the intensity of the MATLAB and the simulation work that we're doing. So if we think about it in terms of uh, when we're doing construction or design and construction, there's certainly some MathWorks uh, licenses used in that area. Um, there's a few used in propulsion, but where the main area of um, MATLAB is used in, in our organisation is in the uh, guidance navigation and control and the avionics. So what we're talking about is, is uh, understanding all the maths and the algorithms that help keep our vehicle flying in the right direction and taking all that input data from other key sensors or position navigation such as GPS or momentum systems and then pulling that together to be able to make a decision about how much thrust you're going to push in a certain direction to steer you back on course. So there's a lot of mathematics involved in that and there's uh, everything from filters through to uh, reading and combining information from GPS and, and uh, inertial management systems and that gives the, uh, the I guess the brains of the rocket a clear understanding of where it is and where it needs to go to where what it needs to adjust to get to where it's going does that make sense yeah it does and I my, my, my first thought is how much machine learning is going on so you're obviously capturing that data uh, in a simulated real-time environment and then where where's the potential machine learning there so because obviously it's too complex and it's going too fast for uh, a human to kind of press a so Right now, we're more in the uh, the modelling and analytical side that is pre-flight. So our yep. first flight in 2022. Um, my understanding, and I'm probably not the right person to talk to, but my understanding is that when we start getting data from the vehicle and we start analysing that data over several flights, that's where the machine learning is going to start coming in, when it's actually looking at real-earth data and then it's going to be able to put that back into the model. So we are, uh, in some respects, we're doing a bit of that already. We're doing in hardware in the loop testing and so um, uh, with that hardware in the loop we actually have um, simulations on the, de the bench and we're also but we're mainly doing statistics such as Monte Carlo analysis and a few other things like that to give us a probability um, the real machine learning is probably going to start when we start launching and having successful launches and then when, we, when you have that series of um, uh, a streaming of data which an enormous amount of data is obviously going to come through and then we're able to go and backtrack and analyse that and get some uh, new insight into how the vehicle's performing. Are you operating in a sort of a virtual cloud environment or are you working with sort of high performance computing on premises? How, how is it working from the from the actual processing? So there's, there's very little, uh, there is some work that's being done in the cloud. Um, that's the simulation runs uh, because we can do so many more simulation runs in the cloud in a short period of time with scalable computing. Uh, most of the other work is done on-prem and uh, there'll be a balance based on uh, based on the, the the need for what what needs to be done in the cloud and what's better done on prem and also there'll be aspects such as security and a whole bunch of things that we think that you know where is it stored on the cloud is it sovereign cloud and all those sort of things have to come into it yeah um and maybe stefan in terms of math works how maybe your your environment i take it uh matt labs and the like is operating in a cloud environment now um fully and 
customers can just use as much as they can or is it a, a, a set license to what they can uh, use? No, absolutely. So in, uh, in the past uh, five years, we've, we've invested a lot in, in, in helping and enabling our clients to, uh, to process algorithms and execute algorithms on the cloud. Um, so today you can you can really run on Amazon, on Azure, uh, even on um, on um, the uh, supercomputing um, facility out of ANU, for example, in Australia. Yeah. So really, uh, our our engineers and scientists have a, a a really wide range of possibility of where they want to run. Obviously, uh, obviously, when they need a lot of CPUs, um, one of our clients choose to go to the cloud. Uh, rather than buying their own uh, their own infrastructure, it's, uh, it's more cost effective for them. Yep. Um, and maybe I was going to come back maybe to Gilmore. In terms of your key partners, uh, you, you've recently signed a MOU with Northrop Grumman, um, and you're obviously working with some others. And I just saw on your website here, uh, Momentus, uh, which is a commercial space company offering in-space infrastructure. So you've got a new agreement with them. Wait, what did that just come up recently, or maybe can you give us a background on what you're doing with Momentus? Okay, so uh, I, I, it'd be difficult to mention Momentus without talking about space machines as well. Yeah. So we have two um, launch agreements uh, currently, which is pretty encouraging. So uh, the first, um, the first one we were able to publicise was actually with space machines, and they're an Australian company that's making a space tug. What a space tug is, is it's a, a kind of a scalpel that takes the um, takes the, the vehicles that we're putting into orbit and will actually place them into a uh, phased, so that the, the vehicles are phased around a particular orbit, or in some cases they can actually change the orbital plane. So it depends how much delta V, which is the um, uh, the way of saying how much power you've got to go and move those orbits, but they are like a, um, uh, we take them up to a particular orbit and the, the, the um, orbital transfer vehicles, uh, which is what Momentus like uh, call their vehicle, or the space tank, which is the uh, space machines variant, are both um, very good at doing that very precise um, arrangement of the satellites in a constellation. So when we talk about the agreements, um, there's two agreements that we've got. Um, the, the, most recent, uh, the most recent one that we announced was Momentus, and this is pretty significant for the Australian space industry because they are an American uh, company that's, uh, that shows that they've got confidence in what we're doing. They've seen our plans, they've seen our progress to, uh, to launch, and they've committed to uh, working with us uh, on, their, on our launch program. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, the I, I guess the the real benefit of, of this conversation is is looking at what we're doing in the Australian market, uh, and we're seeing some real growth potential in the Australian market with uh, space machines, and they'll actually be carrying a sensor uh, for fire detection from a company called Fireball, right. and uh, Fireball International is actually an international company. But the uh, directors are here in Australia. They're actually based in Queensland as well, and they'll be putting their their fire detection sensors onto the uh, the space machine space tug. So this is very exciting as well. That's the bush fire detection. I take it. Absolutely. Yeah. So they're, they're doing a fantastic job with um, early warning. Um, mm. Sometimes within seconds, they're being able to detect where fires are, are around the world. Um, but they're obviously focused on doing Australia and North America because those are the places that seem to make the news each year. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of traction in that space. In terms of the the payloads, maybe let's uh, come back to Australia in terms of the launch locations. We understand there's there's been three nominated and one's in Queensland. Uh, is that where you, you're going to focus on? Uh, is this going to be a bit competitive between the states or a company like Gilmore will move around to whichever is the suitable location here in Australia? I, I think that you've, you've answered the question. So the different launch sites have different capabilities. For example, uh, even though you can launch in a, to a particular orbit from a particular launch site, the question is should you? So if you are in a uh, equatorial zone and you want to launch into an equatorial orbit, and um, I imagine you've got MathWorks on here, so you're going to have some um, maths freaks here. <laughs> the efficiency of your launch is the cosine of your latitude. 
So the closer you are to zero, the closer you are to 100% of the efficiency because you're taking advantage of the Earth's spin. Yeah. If you start um, launching in the, the sun synchronous or polar orbits, it's actually more efficient to launch from a northern or southern uh, launch site. So when we think about uh, Southern Launch and Boulder's Way, they, uh, they're not promoting themselves as an equatorial or a mid-inclination orbital, um, in so, uh, yeah, orbital trajectories. They're, they're promoting themselves as uh, polar, sun-synchronous, uh, which is about 97 degrees for most satellites, and then uh, a whole range of uh, orbit, orbital angle, or, or sorry, um, launch trajectories around that um, uh, kind of maybe even up to 60 degrees but it's more you'd be more encouraged as a launch, site, uh, launch vehicle to do polar and sun synchronous out of a, um, a southern or a northern base launch site when you start going north you can launch to a uh, an orbit uh, equivalent or greater than the latitude unless you're prepared to spend a lot of power to change your direction of your spacecraft. Um, and they, they do it, um, SpaceX does it, they do a dog lick, and so does the uh, PLTLB from India. They move around Sri Lanka and do a dog lick, but that costs you a lot of energy. Yeah. So if we're talking about just launches that don't cost energy, the closer you are to the equator, the better it is for equatorial and the more options you have for mid-inclination orbits. And if you're going to launch in a in a, a, a north-south sort of orbit, so polar or sun synchronous, you're better off to go from uh, South Australia. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I was going to say the opportunity there, but I was just going to put it out to the audience. Anyone listening, if you've got a good maths question on space, then welcome. We'll, we'll test Stefan as best he can uh, if you happen to have one. Um, but it, does that is that the, the opportunity here for Australia to be able to offer uh, that efficiency uh, in these launch sites and and those options that might be different to other countries? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, if you think about what our business plan is, our business plan is not going to rely. I mean, we've, we're going to absolutely service the Australian market, but our business plan is to make sure we're a. Uh, it's a bit hard to understand for some people. And we take a little bit of time to get the message across. But we're actually an exporter. So we will bring their payloads into Australia and then we'll, we'll export them into space, I guess, is the answer. Right. So uh, our market is going to be making sure we service the Australian market really well. But we are inevitably, we're going to be an exporter by bringing payloads into Australia and taking them out. Now, the, the launch sites have made no secret of the fact that they want to attract uh, other companies launch site launch vehicles into Australia and launch from their sites and that's their business model and they're, they're pursuing that with great vigor and I believe Southern Launch would have told you they've already got a few contracts signed yep. for those um, those SSO or polar launches so they're doing really well I think the other thing is the payloads you talked about you're at the 300 to 500 and then you're moving up to potentially two tons what what are those payloads? Are they are they more the you sort of start starting at um, lower Earth orbits, then mid range, and then going out to geos? Is that kind of the the plan? So you have to um, think about it in terms of uh, what the new space is compared to old space. So and I, I hate these Gen X, Gen Y, and Millennial type we, terms. We just called it Space Two Point So I thought it'd be <laughs> higher than two, but apparently it's just two. Well, they have a definition for Space Two Point Oh. By the time you get to Space Four, every the economy is actually in space and doesn't have to come back to Earth. Got so uh, that's what you've got to think about. What what it actually means. There is a definition behind it. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I think, probably more realistic than. The reference I made to Gen X and Gen Y. <laughs> so, uh, with respect to a launch, when you uh, think about it uh, simplistically, it's one payload to one orbit. Well, reality is that's probably not going to be the case for most of our launches. We're going to have um, what's called share rides, and so we will probably have a, a primary payload, and then we'll have a series of smaller payloads that are comfortable going to the same orbit and sharing that ride and making compromises with where they want to go perhaps or using a space tug like the ones that we've mentioned before and us getting them to a particular orbit and then the space tugs taking them to a slightly different orbit or phasing them around the same orbit. So there's, there's a whole bunch of options and it's quite a spectrum of different um, possibilities when it comes to launch. When we start talking about the larger vehicle, then 
with 2,000 ton, sorry, 2,000 kilos to a Leo, now we start thinking about can we get to a geostationary orbit? And so GTO, geostationary transfer orbit, that orbit we can, um, it doesn't mean you get 2,000 kilos to geostationary, but we could probably get, um, you know, five to 700 ton, uh, kilos to a geostationary orbit. Right. And that, that means that we have, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me and it means we have more options for different payloads. Very good, and that makes you more competitive, and then you've also got that the price. Um, we might come back just to, to finish off. I'm conscious of time on on where you, you see that. We, we just mentioned um, sort of Space 2.0, and you mentioned Space 4, and we're at kind of all the others. We might just have a – we might finish off with that. And, uh, Stefan, MathWorks, as you say, you're the sort of the basis of the engineering um, and, and the maths going into to this science, for want of a better word. Um, where do you see the Australian market? Are you seeing growth and uptake there? Are you seeing really advanced research to what are you seeing elsewhere in the world? How would you sort of define or, or rate the Australian market and the space industry and, the, and sort of the, the pace of, uh, of growth? Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the Australian and, and New Zealand market. Uh, in, uh, in recent years, quite a, a significant growth uh, from that space. Uh, I think there is a, a conjunction of, of elements that makes um, the Australian market and, and this industry um, um, for a very bright future. Um, the, the first one is, I think the Australian government is sending the right signal um, with the creation of the um, Australian Space Agency in 2018. Um, I think send the right signal to the, the smaller companies that they will have access to funding and we, we certainly saw some of the smaller startups to, to be able to, to really uh, kick off their business with the backing of the Australian Space, Space Agency, but also knowing that they will have access to the larger organizations such as NASA or the Japan Space Agency. Um, the second element is we have our universities, and, and we, we work a lot with universities, obviously, for teaching and learning uh, engineering, but we form the best engineers in the world, and we certainly see a lot of activities with our universities in terms of space, uh, research, science, and education. Um, a lot of young engineers are quite excited to join. We have a uh, very strong uh, aerospace defense industry. Um, and, and that brings a lot of experience from the defense industry and the aerospace. And you mentioned drones as well and robotics uh, into this, this space 2.0 uh, industry. I mean, you, you interviewed Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd is a good yeah. friend of mine for, for many years from, from a, a DST, Defense Science and Technology Group. Uh, and obviously, Lloyd brought all this experience into the, the space. Um, Kudos to, uh, to Gilmore Space and Rocket Lab uh, in New Zealand. I mean, they, they are the pioneer of this industry in Australia. And I think they also uh, showed that there is a viable industry for, for, for Australia. Um, who who do you think is, is driving it for Australia? Has it been government um, or is it defence or is it our sort of um, relationship with what's happening in the US? Uh, where is it? Because obviously space went through a sort of a, uh, a, a lag or, or it sort of just occurred in the background and then now there seems to be much more impact and now it's a priority for the Australian government uh, and what we're seeing with SpaceX and the like. Uh, it, is it, so SpaceX is driven by industry and that commercialisation of space. Um, which, which is the stronger between industry, government and defence? And defence and government are slightly different in terms of how I, I view them. How would you describe that? Or are they happening simultaneously? All of them together. <laughs> All of them together. And I think, I think the other element that was really important for Australia is uh, the technology has evolved so much that now you can pack in a very small payload a lot of technology. Uh, Peter, you were mentioning uh, CubeSats in, in less than 10 kilos. You, yeah. you have uh, more, more smarts than what was in the Apollo mission. Uh, by far. Um, so it's so, happened simultaneously with with the technology, and I mentioned the payloads sort of on, on drones. You couldn't put a, a camera on a drone 15 years ago. It was too heavy or you didn't have the money to 
to shrink it down as electronics has shrunk and and all and the proce computer processing power has improved it allows us to be more efficient in everything almost like the perfect storm of everything coming together for uh, space 2.0 to sort of become a reality right completely completely okay well then that takes me to where space is going and i'd like to finish off this is our last episode for the year as well as we as we finish a crazy 2020 uh it you know again i'm hit, hitting 50 next year for me and so even just saying 2020 and saying 50 is a bit scary but um you know we're almost now in the future so when i was leaving school 30 years ago and, and those and entering industry where are we going to be in the next sort of 20 to 30 years and the pace of change along that way is this 2020 to 2030 the real decade to be looking at and uh, if we talk about space 4.0, what what year is that projected out to be? Uh, head of sales, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you're asking me when space two, uh, space 4.0 happens. Well, that's a, that's a pretty hard question. But <laughs> if we if we go and ask ourselves, what are the steps that we need to get there? And it's you know what do they say eighty percent of futurists are always wrong. So um, uh, I guess I temper it with that. The speed of change at the moment and the hunger for uh, achieving certain goals in space is driven by uh, almost it feeds on itself. And at the moment, we're seeing an activity on the, uh, particularly the moon. Um, China has just brought back some samples. Uh, and fantastic. China's, you know, really, really making some headway in, in the lunar uh, exploration area. I, I can't see anybody backing off the pedal on that. And when you think about what makes the moon work, it's not going to be because somebody's bringing stuff up from the Earth. So uh, yeah, bring it back, right? and bringing it back, it's going to be because it's going to be self-sustaining, its own power, its own ability to do food, water, yeah. and and treat its rubbish. So on on the the the, the four point zero space four point zero side, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a, a big stretch of the imagination to say that by twenty thirty we've got some sort of habitat and uh, an economy and and some sort of resource extraction. Um, happening on the moon and the the things that excite people is that uh, include things like years ago they they wouldn't um, they they couldn't find water yeah. and now they're finding water now water is very important um, and we don't live without it but it's also a way of uh, you know potentially getting energy out of um, there's also a big push to find minerals, uh, particularly the you know the titaniums and the things that we can put into 3D printers, yep. because we're not going to have the same. You can't just go and build, bring a bulldozer and a bricklayer up to the moon and start building a house. Uh, and there's a lot of work being done into how we live in these habitats in a in a particularly nasty environment, because the moon is. Uh, doesn't have sorry the moon doesn't have any of the radiation protection it doesn't have any of the things that we're going to find on earth so it is a totally it is quite a difficult thing to solve yet there's so much energy and there's so much uh, activity to try and solve it and people see it as a must do now so i really think it's accelerating and by the end of this decade we're going to see uh, certainly going to see um habitation on the moon and it is that unlimited resource. If, we, if you can access the unlimited resource, which it takes us back several generations of, of human civilization, where we thought the Earth was un, an unlimited resource, and we can just, you know, uh, yeah, we haven't treated it well. But uh, we're obviously going to start to do that. And once we do that, um, whoever does it first. And I, this is what I'm sort of why we're covering this and taking more interest, apart from just it being very, very exciting. Uh, it is that competition with, say, the likes of the US and China. We've got India in there. Pretty much all na uh, nation states are in there as well. Um, so it's a fascinating area. One question I had, and I'm a West Australian by birth um, and born in the Pilbara. How much how much interest is mining uh, and mining companies taking in this? Because I, I, I view, you know, in terms of the remote mining operations that we're seeing in Western Australia and the technology involved in that, uh, other than defence technology and sort of military type applications, it has to be the mining operations that 
must be taking an interest in this. How much is going on? And maybe Stefan, if you're nodding, if that rings a bell. Yes. Uh, so we work a lot with with miners um, in in Australia, and obviously they moved. Um, so they're already in the mining 2.0 or 3.0. They moved from traditional extraction to automation, as you mentioned, automation, artificial intelligence, and simulation to extract as much as they can with the, the minimal um, footprint. Um, what I'm excited, actually, as Peter mentioned, is, is we have a unique knowledge in engineering, in mining engineering, that we can export for space exploration. Um, and, and we are far ahead of, of any other countries, for that matter. So I do think that there's a bright future for, for other industries, such as mining, in the space exploration. Uh, I will say that today they are observing. Uh, <laughs> they're observing. They, they certainly, uh, we are developing, um, well, we, when we say we, the, the mining industry is developing systems and tools that will be uh, exportable to, to a space usage quite easily. So when you think about, uh, for example, an autonomous system in an underground mine with a lot of exposure to uh, chemicals and radiation, Obviously, they are developing this robust system that you can bring um, quite easily um, on the moon, for example. So I think uh, I think there's there's a lot of, of development uh, in terms of uh, commercialization. I think they are still observing what's what's happening. Um, well, they're, they're often cashed up too, uh, as well. And as you say, um, I definitely know that there's some activity in Western Australia, at least, uh, just with autonomous systems and the like. And once something's autonomous, well, then, uh, as you say, you just have to make it sure it can work in a hostile environment, which is pretty much the pilgrim in Northwest Australia anyway. Um, look, just to finish off, uh, we haven't even touched on things like regulation and all that, so that's all good. Maybe um, the, the key skills and opportunities here, just to finish, um, Gilmore, uh, Peter, what are those key skills uh, that, that you think the industry needs or might be short on? Uh, and then we'll finish off with Stefan in terms of maybe the researchers and the universities, uh, what courses uh, are really hot right now. Yeah, Gilmore, what, what kind of the skills base that you're going to need uh, to, to sort of scale up? Okay, so uh, the, the, the way the organisation is at the moment, it's very hard to go anywhere without running into an engineer. So um, scientists and engineers, more likely engineers, because we're not talking theoretically, we're talking about turning spanners. Absolutely, we need to have uh, the top uh, university engineers coming into us. Now, we've got universities from uh, graduates from all over the world working with us, yeah. um, but obviously uh, they, they fly from interstate and from Queensland-based universities are the Do most prevalent. And engineers, mechanic, just basically any type of engineering, uh, even from computer engineering through to mechanical engineering. Oh, absolutely. We've got yep. mechanical propulsion, so chemical engineers. We've got um, a whole, like the whole spectrum. Yep. Because engineering, you don't come out specifically as a particular engineer. You have to do a lot of engineering to get there. Yep. But when we scale up and when we start building, it's not going to be just engineers. We're going to have a lot of tradespeople with specialist trades. And so uh, as we start, um, uh, for example, we've got filament winders, we're going to have ablatives, we're going to have a whole variety of things that needed to be uh, assembled. Uh, we have a, a strong uh, skill set in um, you know, advanced manufacture at the moment with 3D printers right through to um, uh, CNC machines, CNC lathes. We're, we're really, our skill base, we're going to take the best engineers, we're also going to take the best tradespeople. And when you say what's the thing that's that we need to have, obviously we're going to require the, you know, we're, we're going to be the employer of the above average engineers, obviously. Yeah. But it's going to be about passion. We've got to have the right, you know, the right attitude and the passion there for space because we know we're doing a lot of things the first time anyone's ever done it. And, and I take it uh, you're in that advanced additive manufacturing as well, trying absolutely. different things as well. I look, that's that's the thing you cover all aspects. Uh, Stefan, in terms of that, the sort of the research and and the sort of the courses that are available, uh, is it all there for the uh, at the moment for Australia to benefit from, or are we needing to improve in particular areas? 
No, I do think so. I think the Australian universities are, are top notch in terms of, of uh, research and, and education in, in the space uh, in the space uh, industry. Uh, if you look at most of the uh, most of the large universities have a have a space program, uh, yeah. but beyond beyond space or space 1.0, I mean, uh, beyond flying the bird uh, and so the mechanical and, and the electronics uh, engineering. Beyond that, I think what we are seeing, and we're seeing universities investing in in, in, in those domains such as robotics, autonomous systems, um, even agriculture or advanced manufacturing, yeah. as Peter mentioned. I think those will be very important for the next generation of, of engineers um, as a holistic approach to space exploration. And certainly in Australia, we, we in New Zealand as well. Uh, we see the universities investing in, in, in this kind of curriculum. Very good. Look, um, we're going to have to have you both on again uh, next year at some point, I'm sure. Uh, it is, and it's the other thing in my mind of we've, we've put space and defence together. We are sort of, we cover security, the security domain more so. I just hope defence stay out of the space and space can sort of uh, go forward. But I think uh, that's where the challenge will be um uh going forward for for what we do see in space that militarization the geopolitics involved uh so that's one of our motivations to cover that uh fascinating but uh, i also see it from the mining as you say agriculture pretty much every industry will be impacted by this as well as the technology that comes out of that that we can apply in other industries as well so look thank you so much uh, peter kinney uh, the head of sales for gilmore space technologies uh and uh, did I say that right, Kinney? Yeah. Uh, and Stefan Moroni, uh, the country manager for MathWorks. So much for, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll put you backstage and I'm just going to finish off uh, with our well wishes for the year. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Peter and Stefan. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Stefan. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. I'll send you the links. Thanks, gents. Thank Bye. You. Okay. So that's, uh, let me just move this over for a second. Uh, that's pretty much it from us in 2020. Uh, the report of the day, as I normally do, uh, spear phishing. This came out from Barracuda just this morning. I don't even know it's on our website just yet. It'll be going up today. Rise in the number of business email compromise attacks, uh, up 12% of all spear phishing attacks, which was up from 7% in 2019. So Beck fraud uh, is definitely one to be watching uh, for businesses. The other one is 71% of spear phishing attacks include malicious URLs, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's quite a high number. And 13% of all spear phishing attacks come from internally compromised accounts. So make sure you're aware of those accounts that you've got on your internal environment. So look, what's in store for 2021? I was going to start putting up logos. There was too many uh, to do. We've just finished off the renewal of the marketplace. There's still a few different things that we're, we're doing, but 2021, uh, we'll continue with that program. Uh, I mentioned new websites. We've got a smartcitiestech.io website coming uh, and that's live. So you can at least register for these websites. Space and Defence is another one. So that takes us to about 10 channels uh, that we've got covering. We're also renewing all of our websites. Uh, the new Australian Cybersecurity Magazine is up, but we're just finishing off a couple of little things on that. Uh, we've also expanding our products range on the marketplace and lining up a few more giveaways and some merchandise for next year. So we're very excited. Uh, it's been a challenging year, 2020, uh, but it's also been uh, a rewarding and productive year for us. So look, have a great Christmas. Thank you very much for joining us on My Security TV and our Tech and Sec weekly series, and we'll see you again in 2021. Thanks.